Hello, good morning. Good to see you. If you're joining us online, welcome. We're so glad that you chose Vineyard Church, our online service, to uh, join us as we really kick off this new series we're doing, Your Truth Matters. We all have a truth we're operating from, so we're going to talk about that because that uh, is important. That's important, but so glad that you're here with us today. Well, there's a guy named Saeed Kadoop. About 50, 60 years ago, he's an Egyptian political figure, but he was uh, very uh, divisive. In fact, he, was, he, he hated Jewish people, hated Christians, and he had radical ideas that were very violent, uh, and, and, and so he was jailed because he was causing so much uh, uh, turbulence. And, but even in jail, I mean, he was still spewing his hatred for Jews and for Christians and for the West in general. He was really a fascist. He read all kinds of fascist material. He's read a lot of the same stuff Hitler read. And, and, but he was spewing all of that, cause, even in jail, causing all of these violent eruptions. So they, uh, they, they, put, him, they, they put him to death. That didn't stop his, his, his viewpoint, though. Because his brother, Mohammed Kadup, took what he taught in prison and before that and went back to Saudi Arabia, became a professor, was teaching that. And so you might not have even heard of Saeed Kadup or Mohammed Kadup, but, but Mohammed Kadup's star pupil, Osama bin Laden, you probably have heard of. Right? Because he, he really brought us, ushered in a new level of of terrorism that now, and, and Al-Qaeda, it was the underpinning of Al-Qaeda, all from a, uh, a viewpoint, a worldview, their version of truth into the world. And, and, and so here it is, it affects us decades later. We now wait in long lines at TSA, take our shoes off, all kinds of stuff, impacted by somebody's worldview from 60 years ago. A lot of times we're not aware that we are impacted so, as much as we are by other people's worldview. And it happens all the time. People have worldviews, and, they're tr- and, they, and they, they come at us from advertisers, movies, things we read, social media, stuff we watch on TikTok, uh, celebrities. Every, everybody has a worldview, and they're all speaking it. Sometimes we're not even aware of it, but it's coming at us. And if you root your worldview into the wrong worldview, into, a, into a, a truth that's not really true, you'll find your life filled with anxiety, with stress, depression. All kinds of things happen when we, are, when we have a skewed worldview. So we want to look at it from God's point of view. What's God's perspective? And so looking, so we're all on the same page, a definition of worldview, the beliefs that I build my life on. Sometimes we're not even cognizant of it. We don't, maybe we don't even label it that way. But it's our view of what, what I think about God, what I believe true about God, what I believe true about myself, what I believe true about people, about Satan, about life, about death, about the afterlife, my future, pain, suffering, problems, what I believe true about good or about evil, what I believe true about my relationships, about how I'm supposed to spend my time, how I'm supposed to spend my money. All of those choices, those decisions, and those beliefs are a worldview, and they impact us, the big ones as well as the small ones. For example, we get worldviews from other people, from movies, script writers, like uh, The Lion King. Lion King's an animated movie, right? And it's about the circle of life. That's what Mufasa tells us. Circle of life. See, it's a secular, secular, circular worldview, which is really more of an Eastern uh, perspective. Hinduism is based on that, and, 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 and it's a different worldview than the Christian worldview. Uh, another one would be Star Wars. Star Wars, right? An impersonal, non-deity force that holds everything together, and if you tap into it, there's all this power. That's a worldview, and, and it, that's being suggested there. Also, Forrest Gump. Remember Forrest Gump? Life is like a box of chocolates, right? You never know what one you'll get. Here's, here's one from Finding Nemo. I have a granddaughter, so we're watching these kinds of movies now. <laughs> when life gets you down, just keep swimming. You know, I heard that. I thought, that's a worldview. That's what do you do when, when you're in hardship? And so 
worldviews are all around us, and everybody has one. Again, you might not even be cognizant of it. You might not be dialed in. But our brain is making choices on it. Every decision you make, you get out of the car and you decide to cross the street, you're, you're dialing into, is it safe? And our, our brain was wired that way with images and, and past experiences and things we've read. And, and in a moment, just in a flash, we make a decision based on our beliefs. And, and a worldview is like that. You have all of these beliefs, and it impacts your life. That's why it's not just an academic exercise we're in. We're going to spend four weeks to really dig into it and say, what, what's going on in our worldview? Some of you have made a decision for Christ, and the Bible says that when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, we have a new identity in Christ. We have, we, we have a whole new viewpoint, or we're supposed to. See, we're new. God's working at us. His Holy Spirit's in us. But many times we're still operating on old recordings and old playlists that we've been living out for years. And so here we are. We've made a decision of faith. We love Jesus now, but we're still acting on all of these old, outdated, and faulty worldviews. And it causes all kinds of stress and anxiety and depression and um and uneasiness, and then we're wondering, why has my life not gotten better? I feel like it's the same thing. Here's some things that happen. When you have a wrong worldview, which there is a wrong worldview, when you have a wrong worldview, we start asking questions like this. Why are things not working out for me? Why is this happening why are things not happening the way I thought that they should be happening? We're, we're questioning our worldview at that point. Because God actually has an answer. He has a pathway. He has a plan and a purpose for you. And when we get off kilter, when we're operating from a faulty worldview, everything starts to not make sense any longer. It's like, what's going on here? And your beliefs can make you miserable. Amen. Now, the good news is that you can change what you believe. You, nobody, you're not in North Korea, right? I mean, you, you can decide. Nobody's got a gun to your head. You can decide if you're miserable because of your worldview. You can decide today, I'm changing that. I don't need to be miserable any longer. That's not God's will for me. It's not God's plan for me. But we're constantly bombarded with these worldviews. And so we're going to label them today. Maybe you've never done that before. But the first one is really about more. It's a worldview of materialism. Materialism, which is, I will be happy if I own more stuff. Why will I be happy? Because people will finally respect me. People will look up to me. I'll be somebody important. Because I know, because celebrities and athletes and people that have lots and lots of things, everybody wants to be like them. Everybody's waiting in line to serve them. And, and we get caught up in that mentality. And we think that that's where it's at. And so some of us were tied into materialism. And you go, well, that's, you know, that's the American dream. Life, liberty, and the purchase of happiness, right? And if I can't afford it, that's okay. I've got credit. No problem. I'm getting that regardless of whether I can afford it or not because it will help prop up my sagging self-esteem because I've tied my self-esteem, my net worth, and my, and my, and my uh, self-worth together. And so I feel bad because I don't have enough toys to play with. I don't have enough things. And, and so that becomes a problem. I was talking to a young person recently. She was saying that one of her friends was, was, is, was talking all about, can't wait till he get this great paying job and he's going to make all this money. And, and they were saying, well, you know, what should I say? I said, well, is he making all that money to give it away? So he can be generous? Of course not, right? No. See, so he's tying into materialism. I, this young person is thinking, if I make all this money, I'll be happy. I'll be respected. I'll be somebody. Now, Jesus came along and challenged worldviews all the time. I mean, you read the Gospels, and he's like always disrupting people's way of belief, their, their truth that they tied into. In fact, he would say often, he'd say, you've heard it said before, but I say unto you, what is he doing? He's challenging a worldview. You've always operated on this truth, 
but it's faulty. Here is what God says is true. And that's what we want to talk about. What is God saying to us? Here's one of the things Jesus said. He said, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So a lot of people, that's all that matters. The more things I'll have, I'll do anything to get more things. Jesus comes along, he challenges that worldview. He goes, no, that's not a good worldview. Second worldview is, is really a me first. It's all about me. It doesn't matter if it hurts other people. I'm, I, it's more about what I want. And commercials and advertisers love to play into this. You know, have it your way, obey your thirst, you deserve it, right? And really, it's the worldview of narcissism, individualism. It, it's, it's all about me. What affects me? I'm first. I'm most important. And so we operate and make decisions about that in our relationships, with our job. It doesn't matter if it hurts other people because it's all about me. And so it's very self-centered. Even if it hurts the community, hurts people around me. Now, Jesus taught a totally different worldview. Totally different. And, you know, there's secular counselors, let's be honest. That's the re- now, there's secular counselors that have bought into other worldviews, and then there's godly biblical counselors. They have a different view. That's why when I, over the years, when I've seen a counselor, sometimes marriage counseling, sometimes individual, my first session with any therapist I've not met with before it's not about me. It's about them. They go, okay, well, how can I help you? Well, no, no. This first hour, I have some questions for you. And I start digging. I want to know what their worldview is because I don't want them spewing some weird worldview into my life. I want to make sure they're grounded biblically so that they can add value to me. Not, not, even though their intentions are good, they're gonna end, I'll end up worse. If your first concern is to look after yourself, You'll never find yourself. But if you give up your life for me, Jesus says, you will find true life. So he says, one perspective is look out after yourself. That's all that matters. I find my significance in success, in salary, in status. This is a worldview. Jesus says, no. I find, my, I find my significance in service. That's certainly not a world, a, a, a world, I mean, that's the, you won't hear that in the world very much. You find your significance in serving God and serving others. No, no, this worldview of narcissism says live for yourself. The third worldview is me first mentality. Me first. I, I, I'm going to do whatever feels good. I mean, YOLO. Live with gusto. Got to have fun. Hedonism. Hedonism. In other words, hedonism is is whatever. What's most important to me is what brings me comfort. Whatever brings me fun. Excitement. I want to, that's, I got to, I'm going to live for pleasure. And that becomes your number one goal. Is is I've got to feel good. But listen, if you're following God's plan for your life, God's plan sometimes takes us through the valley of the shadow of death. It's not always, you know, rainbows and unicorns. Sometimes it's painful. So if you live with hedonism, it starts to twist and bend your theology. You know, like, hey, what's wrong? You know, why is God doing this? We start asking these kinds of questions because joy and pleasure is a byproduct of serving God. It's not the goal. For some people, it's all about pleasure, 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 fun, fun, fun. That's my goal in life. How do you even know if you're a hedonist? Because that's kind of a, you know, who wants to admit to that? Well, if you're asking questions like this, it's my, if you're making statements like this, my goal in life is retirement. I don't want to have to do anything. And I want to make a bunch of money so I can have fun and have, you know, experience cool things and you go, well, what's wrong with that, Andy? It's, we're not talking about what's wrong with it. We're talking about that's hedonism. That's a worldview that you've bought into. And if you are going to want to know what's wrong with it, it's what God says not to do. Now, if you're not a believer, you're going, well, hey, it's not my fault. I, don't even, I, I haven't read the Bible. I haven't even asked Christ into my life. You've got to find yourself in, a, you'll have a worldview. 
we're covering some of the major ones in America right now. Here's what we learn in Scripture. It says, are you addicted to, th- to, to thrills? What an empty life. The pursuit of pleasure is never satisfied. Mick Jagger sang, I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> 60 years ago is when that, came, that song came out. It's still true today. He's still singing it today. He's still on tour. He's got his own cardiologist that goes with him. <laughs> he probably should retire, actually. I don't know about if you want to see a 79-year-old guy shake his booty, you know. You know. So at sometime it's, it's you're done. But it's a worldview, right? Of pursue pleasure, hedonism. The fourth worldview is whatever works for you. Doesn't matter if it's there is no right or wrong. In fact, there's kind of this un unspoken reality today in our pluralistic society shame on you if you say somebody's doing something wrong you know that that's wrong (laughs) the only thing that's wrong is when you say to somebody else that's not right you shouldn't be doing that so like hey if it's working for you that's that's all that matters that's a worldview a worldview of pragmatism whatever works here's the problem with that is that some there's evil in the world and pragmatism, paired up with evil, creates some pretty bad results. If I'm talking to you and all of a sudden you irritate me, I pull out a gun and shoot you, you're no longer irritating me. But it wasn't a good thing to do. Right? I've, I've eliminated that problem. It's pragmatic. It worked for me. Problem done. Hitler used pragmatism as his reason, rationale, while he killed Six million Jews. They were a problem for him, and he eliminated them. And really the genocides of Sudan and, and uh, Bosnia and, and Rwanda, so forth, they're, they're all pragmatic. These people are a problem. Let's eliminate them. See, and it's not always extreme like that. Whenever you have evil and selfishness at work, and you marry that to pragmatism, you're going to get some pretty hideous results it's going to break up it's going to end up in in divorced homes and broken homes and people all a mess because it, but they were pragmatic they were pragmatic here's what the bible says there is a way that seems right for a man but in the end it leads to death it seems it's going well hey listen it's i've got I'm going somewhere with this, you know, Machiavellianism, you know, just, you know, as long, you know, as the ends justify the means. If it's a good end, it, does, it, gets, it gets a little messy on the way there. That's okay because, you know, I had, a, I had good intentions. And a lot of things seem right until we hit against God's universal laws. See, God doesn't just have opinions. He has laws. And when you break them... You really don't, we don't break law, God's laws, they break us, is what happens. I mean, a good example is a uh, physical law, of, the law of gravity. You could say, well, I don't like the law of gravity. And so I don't even think I believe in that right now. And so you go up to the top of, you know, the Empire State Building, and you jump off. I don't believe in the law of gravity. And about halfway down, I open up the window, and you're coming by, I go, how's it going? <laughs> so far, so good. Because you haven't hit the bottom yet. People do that all the time. Oh, yeah, I've been cheating on my taxes for years. How's it going? So far, so good. Cheating on my spouse. How's it going? So far, so good. Oh, yeah, I'm shady in my business deals. Not been caught yet. So far, so good. You see, whenever we break God's laws, they will, and, and a lot of times people measure it like, well, the consequences haven't hit me yet. But our choices always have consequences. Sometimes they happen immediately. Sometimes they happen down the road. And if you're a pragmatic person, we can easily fall in for the temptation like, oh, I won't get caught. This won't happen to me. And we ignore it. Or we're, not, we're even ignorant of God's laws. There's plenty of people that are not even aware that God has some standards and some laws. So that's part of what it means to be a Christ follower is you step into that world, you say, I asked Christ into my life, now I need to start learning God's plan for my life. 
which is why we do Growth Track. Growth Track is to help you make, make that transition from a non believer to a fully functioning believer or a secular believer. In other words, you believe in Christ, but you're acting like God's not in your life. Or, the, or, the, or you don't know. You're just acting like you would if you, you know, you just come to church. That's about it. You don't serve. You don't make decisions based on biblical, grounded thought life. It's just you, you come to church and you made a decision for Christ. That's, you're a Christian, but the Bible calls you a kind of a, 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 a carnal Christian or a secular Christian. In other words, you're operating like, like the rest of the world does. And so God has things that he wants us to do. The fifth worldview is God doesn't exist. Or if he does exist, he doesn't matter. That's naturalism. Naturalism really is closely tied to atheism. In other words, everything is random. We were, we, we were accidents of nature. There's no grand creator. There's no designer of the universe, of the world, of us. God doesn't even exist. And if he does it, he doesn't matter. Now, logically, if you take the next step, if God doesn't matter, if God doesn't exist or God doesn't matter, you don't matter and I don't matter. That's really what, is, what it ends up with. And then we start, some people are rooted in this worldview, this truth. Oh, yeah, I'm random. This is all an accident. And they, they root, then they try to live out a Christian life and, they're, and then they constantly have this tension in their life. Because there, there's worldviews that are conflicting. Jesus actually said when it comes to worldviews, he says he didn't say it's unwise to have two different world conflicting, two different worldviews that conflict. He said it can't be done. He said you can't serve one worldview and a different competing worldview. One being God, one is a world, the worldview that you get from the world. And, and that is a worldview, this naturalism. We're just educated slime. We've come a long way, baby. We were slime, now look at all that I have, and you know, but no thanks to you, God, because you don't matter, God. And here, if you don't matter, then it doesn't really matter if you're murdered, if you're run over by a car. None of that ha matters because you have no purpose. God has, there is no God who has a plan for you. You have no value. Your only value comes in the fact that God loves you and created you and thought you up. This is the truth that I pray that you walk away with. This is true about you. The other world views are not. Naturalism that says you have no purpose. Bertrand Russell, who was a famous atheist, I don't agree with most of what he said, but he, I did agree with this. He said, if you remove the question of God, the question of purpose of life is irrelevant. It's true. If there's no God or he exists but has but, but is irrelevant. In other words, God's not, not important. He doesn't have a role in my life. He doesn't really matter. Then your life doesn't really matter. You're just an accident. And then that affects how you treat other people. Certainly how you see yourself, but how you see others, how you treat them. And there's all kinds of stuff that comes out that, is, that will lead you down a path of pain. From the beginning of creation, God has shown what he is like by all he has made. So the Bible unapologetically declares that God is the creator of everything. He made everything, including you. And in fact, you look at nature and you can see God's fingerprints all over it. There's a lot of things you can see just by looking at nature. You know, God's creative. Look at how beautiful, you know, the, some of nature is. God loves uh, uh, individuality. God loves, I mean, the fact that he, he's very unique. He, he loves uniqueness. Look at the person next to you. You go, you're unique. You are, you know, and that's because God made, he didn't make us all the same. He made us unique, not just looking unique. We are different. Our, our gifts are different. He loves diversity. He's organized. You see how organized he is. He's powerful. Look at the hurricanes and ocean, you know, how powerful the ocean is. There's a number of things. And so the Bible says because of that, everybody who's looking with, with, with honest eyes, open to God's reality, can see it in nature. Here's what he says. He says that's why those people don't have any excuse, no matter who you are, wherever you're at in the world. 
They know about God, but they don't honor him and even thank him. They claim to be wise, but they are fools. He's talking about you should be able to just identify who God is. You might not know the name of Jesus Christ. That's why missionaries are so important. But you certainly can see God's hand around. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. Honestly, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, to look at uh, creation and all what God's created. To me, it takes more faith to believe it all came as an accident. And I'm just, you know, an accident of nature. It certainly is a sad way to look at it. And, they, and what's funny is, is people that have tied into naturalism, they often feel sad for us. They feel sorry for us. Oh, you need that crutch. You need that. I'm thinking to myself, you're living a life where nobody matters. And you really believe that. And your life doesn't matter. And so you're going to make a bunch of decisions based on that. To me, you look at the, the amazing creation. The earth spins at such a perfect rate. You know, if the, if the earth span, sp- spun a little faster or slower, we would all be burned up. The, a- the earth's on an axis at a particular degree. One degree different, it would completely annihilate humanity. And I mean, the precision of everything, you, as you read about science, if you just look, well, this is, this, this is pretty amazing. It's, this doesn't look like an accident. If you're walking in a desert and you know, on a path and you see like a rock in the pathway or something, you can, well, I don't know, how did that get there? But if you're walking in a desert, nobody's around for miles and miles around, and you're on this, and all of a sudden you come across like a Rolex watch, you're not going to think, well, that, that's probably there by accident. Just kind of, you know, came out of the, uh, came out of the ground. No, you're going to know there's a designer behind that. Look at how intricate it is. That's what it says. And God, the intricacies, the design is clear for all to see. The Bible says, look, look at these verses. Look up to the skies. Who created all the stars and called them by name? The Lord God made the skies and the earth. He put the earth in its place. He did not want the earth to be empty. He didn't just create it like, hey, great, there's an earth, now something's missing. No, he created it with the intention of creating it to be lived on. He, you have a purpose, and he wants you to know your purpose. Now, naturalism says you don't have a purpose. Everything happens by chance. So last worldview I want to talk to you about. That's the godly one. That's theism. Theism. Now, theism is, comes from a Greek word that theo means God, and uh, theology means the study of God. And what this, this worldview is, is that you were created for a purpose. For everything, absolutely everything above and below, visible and invisible, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. Some of you don't know your purpose. You're unclear about that. And as a result of that, you're going to have all kinds of negative emotions and stressors in your life and questions that go unanswered. And that's why we do Growth Track, because we want to help you to figure out what is my purpose. Today is step one right after the service. And some of you are supposed to be in there. You're going, well, I wasn't planning on being there. Well, okay. It doesn't mean you can't go. You know, it's only an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. And it, listen, for some of you, it'll be the best hour you have spent in years. Because choices have results. They have, they have consequences. And so you want to be making choices that affect your life in a positive way. Well, you were made by God for God. And life only makes sense when you understand this. Here's a couple of misconceptions that we give ourselves a buy on sometimes. Two common myths. One is, is the sincerity myth. In other words, well, s- sincerity, you know, should be factored in. Like, oh, if you're sincere, it doesn't really matter. Look at you, you were, you, you were sincere about it. But listen, if you're wrong, I've been sincerely wrong many, many times. I'm still wrong. It doesn't matter how much the sincerity. If I, if, if I drink a liquid that I sincerely believe is water, but it's actually arsenic, I'm going to be sincerely dead, right? You don't want to hear a doctor when you wake up from surgery and he goes, I sincerely thought it was the other arm, you know. 
I thought it was the other leg, you know. I, I put an X in everything. Don't know what happened. The pilot, Ara Zoboyan, who is the helicopter pilot for Kobe Bryant, Guyana and the other people on, the, on board, he sincerely thought he was at a different altitude. And that's, that, that happens, but usually if, you, if you're rated with, you know, instrument rating, that doesn't happen. I'm a pilot. I got a pilot's license when I was in my 20s. I was never instrument rated. So this guy, he's instrument rated, but he only has a few hours beyond what he got in his training. And so he sincerely thought he was higher. He was in the clouds. He couldn't see. But he died. Everybody on board died. But he was sincere. You see, sincerity is not enough when it comes to whether it's true or whether it's not true. Truth is the same as what it was 2,000 years ago as it is today. We're discovering new truths. We discover things with DNA and genomes and particle physics and all kinds of things. Those are just discoveries. They've always been true. If it's a new truth, it's not truth. Secondly, situational myth. In other words, it doesn't matter what you believe because it depends on the circumstance. Oh, yeah, you don't, remember. you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I was going through. This circumstance changed everything. Listen, when we make different decisions, we're pulling from different world views, and depending on the circumstance, it causes what psychologists call cognitive dissonance. We're, 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 there's a conflict of values we're drawing from. But, but it's convenient. It, it certainly is convenient. Oh, I'm going through a difficult marriage. And so I'm going to pull from this worldview right now, me first. Or, or I'm going through a difficult time. I don't have enough. I really want this thing. And I don't have it. So if I, if I you know, deceive my client on the contract, I'll get that huge check. And then I can buy that. Pulling from another, another worldview. And as we start to pull from these, it starts to create all of this disharmony in our life. Conflict. We, it's, there's, and, and, there's, and we don't have peace. We don't have, certainly don't have joy. You can't, you can't serve these worldviews and the kingdom of God. And really, it's a spiritual thing. Really, it's a spiritual thing. The truth is, although we live normal human lives, the battle we are fighting is on a spiritual level. He says that the, these worldviews that we've been talking about, they're really spiritual things. There's a battle going on in your life, in your mind. He says the battle is to break down every deceptive argument and defense that men erect against the true knowledge of God. So there's a battle going on in your mind, a war, so to speak. Fought and won in your mind, which is why we're doing this four-week series on and what is truth and your truth that you buy into matters. It really does. Here's what Gallup Poll says about our understanding of worldviews. He says that 4% of American adults have a biblical worldview. 4%. It's part of the reason we have so many problems. And the world immediately thinks, well, if we're going to solve the problems we have today, government will do it. Ed, you know, the educators will do it. Our academic institutions, a business, if they contribute, that can help. And I'm not saying those things don't help. But the root cause, if it's we're making decisions with a faulty worldview things that that's that's the root problem you say well it's better for christ followers for christians well nine percent of born-again christians self-declared born-again christians have a biblical worldview this is from gallup polls nine percent polling from all these other things that we talked about narcissism materialism naturalism all just world those are i didn't cover them all I covered some of the popular ones. My wish and prayer for you is that you would decide today, God, I'm not going to tie in any more to those. I want to tie into what it means to be a Christ follower. And, under, and, and some of you are going to have to make a commitment. There's a number of you have never even read through the Bible once. And then you're wondering, you're asking those questions. Why are things so tough? You're, you don't even know the laws that you're breaking. God has set up moral laws. He set up universal laws. He set up physical laws. And they break us. We actually don't break those laws. They always hurt us. We're not hurting God. So that's my prayer. That you would say today, today, 
I'm going to start challenging false truths. And I want my life and the decisions I make to be based on what God says. Let's bow our heads and pray. Okay, this is your time with God. We spent a little time singing, kind of declaring what God is like in song. Then we did a Bible study together. But now it's your moment where you go to God. Say, God, I need you. The Bible says that God doesn't, when he brings correction, it's not to make us feel bad, per se, to feel bad about ourselves. He does it because he wants us to correct and change so that we can live the life he has for us. Which is, the Bible refers to that as repentance. Repentance literally means change your mind. That's what it means in the Greek. Change your mind. The battle is in your mind. But as long as we keep using old tapes, old playlists, say, I'm going to make decisions on the fact that I don't really have a purpose. I mean, I, I wish it was true, but down deep, I'm going to make all my decisions knowing that I am just an accident, a freak of nature. Or that I've got to do me first. I've been burned too many times. Another worldview. Too many times I've been hurt because I've put others first. I've served others and then it's turned on me. Worldviews are not a one and done thing. Every person in this room, including myself, can get, can get sucked back into one of the other worldviews. Do you have enough courage to challenge your own truth that you've been operating from? what you believe true about God, what you believe true about the church, the local church, what you believe true about small groups, about marriage, about your work, about retirement, on and on and on. Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, I know you need to do something way bigger than we can do on our own. So I invite you here in this space. Some of you just need to just go to God right now and just say, God, Maybe I've been operating out of fear or insecurity or whatever it is, but I've made a boatload of decisions from a different worldview than yours. And then the next thing you say is, is God, forgive me. Help me. Forgive me for doing that. Teach me your ways. Did you pray that? God, teach me. I want to be a student again and learn from you. Maybe you're older and you're thinking it's too hard. I've done that. I've been there. I've done that. God is way more interested in the direction of your feet today than where you've been, for good or for bad. You could have lived a great life for the, all your life, for decades, but right now you're coasting. You're not really got your gas, your foot on the gas going towards Jesus. That's a worldview. You've bought into a truth there. Father, I pray, Lord, that you liberate us. You help us, each one of us, take from this day to the, our last day and give you our very best. If you've never asked Christ into your life, I want to give you a moment now, your opportunity to say yes to Jesus. You came in here, maybe you were invited by a friend or you learned about us through Google ads or whatever, but here you are and you're thinking, that's why I'm here. Actually, God knew a thousand years ago that you would be here so he could tell you that he loves you. God's word for you is that you do have purpose and that it's not too late. Your life matters. I want to invite you to pray with me 
just right where you're at. I'm not gonna have you stand or come forward with every eye closed, every head bowed. I'm gonna invite you to say, yes, I wanna follow you, Jesus. I want your truth to be my truth. And if that's you, I wanna lead you in a prayer for that very thing right now, boldly. If that's you, let me know about it. Just, just slip your head up so I can see it. Do it right now. This, yep, okay. I see, yeah, there's hands in the back, on the sides. Who else? It's not too late. Say, include me in that prayer. Yep, I see you in the, on the side. A couple more in the back, in the front. Put your hands down. Pray this with me. Say, God, you've given me truths that I can guide my life by. And today, I want to commit to that. Would you say, thank you, God, for sending your son, Jesus Christ, who can guide me and empower me. Would you say, God, Give me a fresh start. I want to anchor myself on you. Whether there's a storm I'm going through or not. Help me, would you say, God, help me to discern what is false. Turn from the world. And go towards you. And to never look back. Would you say, God, I want to do your agenda for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you congratulate those many people who said yes to Christ? I know some of you online did it as well. Let us know about your decision. That's an important decision. And I really want to celebrate with you because I think, I know it changed my life. I I prayed that prayer and, and I'm so glad I did. And I'm so glad you did. Let me know about it. There's a way for you to do that on your Connect card. That's a little card right in front of you. There's a pen there and and you can write any prayer requests you have. Some of you have something that's, uh, you know, you're going through some challenges and you need other people to gang tackle that problem through prayer. We want to do that with you. So you can do that by letting us know on that card. Hey, please pray for me this way. Certainly we want to pray for you if you... Uh, made a decision of faith. Also, let us, we want to have those cards as you're leaving. There's some clear boxes mounted on the wall. We'd love to have you put that in there. You can do that on the QR code as well. Now, if you'd like to give financially towards Vineyard, thank you so much. I know many of you do. If you're new, no pressure to give. We're just glad that you're here. But some of you call this your church home and you support our church. And I just want to tell you, I thank you. One of the ways we do that is once a month, the first Sunday of the month, we pray for those of you who help this uh, this church, this local ministry uh, through your finances. So we're going to do that right now. Would you stand with me? I want to pray over you. Father, thank you for the people who made decisions of faith for you. Lord, I pray that you uproot any kind of competing worldview that any one of us is stuck and, and holding on to. Disrupt that, Lord. Let us know that we are made for a purpose. Lord, I pray for those who need to go to step one today whatever plans they had, that they would reschedule and they'd say nothing's more important than me getting on the same page with God and getting involved and doing step one right after the service. Father, I pray for those who give financially to this church. Open the floodgates of heaven, a blessing. Even those who have been tithing for years, Lord, I pray that you increase that even more. Prevent pests from devouring our crops. Lord, I pray that all people, all nations would see the work of Christ in us and call us blessed. Just like you say in Malachi 3 as a promise for those who died. I pray that over us. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.